Good evening and welcome to Point Blank here at KTN News. Before I speak to my guest, Senior Counsel Abed Abdel Nasir, let us see what he has done before. Ahmed Nasir Abdullahi is a distinguished and accomplished, highly regarded legal practitioner. His legal practice covers a wide variety of areas, ranging from commercial litigation, constitutional and public law, criminal litigation and civil litigation. He is one of the few Kenyan lawyers that have attained the professional grade of senior counsel, earning this title in 2012 under former president Mwai Kibaki. Earning his Bachelor's of Law from University of Nairobi in 1990 and a postgraduate diploma from the same institution a year after, he proceeded to Cornell University in the United States of America to complete his Master's in Law. Thereafter, also earning a certificate diploma in international law from the Hague Academy of International Law in 1993. His first university position was as an assistant lecturer of law at the University of Nairobi between 1992 to 1997. He later on ascended to a fully-fledged lecturer of law, specializing in contract, public international law and conflict of laws. In 2003, he was elected as a chairperson of the Law Society of Kenya for a period of two years. This was followed by an appointment as a commissioner of the Kenya Law Review Commission, as well as an appointment as the chair of Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission Advisory Board through a selection supervised by the former Attorney General Honorable Amos Wako. He was nominated to serve as a society's representative to the Judicial Service Commission, spearheading landmark petitions against judges who he put to task over their past rulings. Most notably was his part with the former Judiciary Chief Registrar Gladys Bos Cholet, who highlighted interference from the Senior Counsel and two other members of the JSC in the Judiciary's search for a new residence in Mombasa to house the court of appeal. JSC eventually carried the day sacking the former registrar over the two billion shilling scandal. Ahmed Nasir, often referred to as Grand Muller, a name bestowed upon him by former Chief Justice Willy Mutunga during the JSC interviews, is a publisher of the Nairobi Law Monthly Magazine and the Nairobi Business Monthly Magazine. His private legal service is characterized by various high-profile cases, culminating in Kenya's presidential election petition of 2013, where he represented the respondents IEBC, and in 2017, in yet another presidential petition, serving as the legal team for IEBC, tasked with convincing the Supreme Court judges that the 2017 presidential vote was free from malpractice. Good evening, you're watching Point Blank here at KTN News. Uh, Senior Council. Karibu sana. Thank you very much. Point Blank. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, Senior Council, I wanted to uh, start with this name, Grand Mula. Uh, you are popularly known throughout the social media world, in the media, as the Grand Mula. Where, where did this uh, title come from? I, th I mean, it's an innocent title I was given to by, by Dr. William Mutunga when he was Chief Justice, you know. During a session when we were interviewing uh, uh, Kalis, I think certain issues of Islamic law came and uh, Willie made the joke sort of like, you know, we don't have to refer to anybody else. We have a grand mullah inside here. But during the time uh, when the JEC had this uh, tussle with the former registrar of the High Court, Cholet, she put a spin to it, you know, to make it look like the, the term grand mullah is, she made it to mean in the context, like, you know, I'm like a dawn, you know, something like a godfather within the JC. Well, you are dressed like Al, <laughs> Al Capone. <laughs> Maybe. Yes, yes, so that's how it came. Now, before we start the program, allow me to wish you Ramadan Karim. Thank Ramadan you very much. Ramadan Mubarak yes, as well. Yes, yes. Ramadan that's, Mubarak. Thank and you. to all the Muslims. Thank you. And the viewers at, uh, of Point Blank and KTN. Now, I want to start with the Judicial Service Commission. Uh, because um, not only uh, are you being senior counsel, but you uh, publish and write. 
and um, I, I read the Nairobi Law Monthly, uh, which, which you are the publisher. Do you have a view uh, about the composition of the Judicial Service Commission as it is now? Uh, what, do, what do you think about this? I mean, I was a member of the first, you know, uh, Judicial Service Commission. I, I represented the Law Society for three years. Now, the JEC is a very important uh, constitutional commission. It's a very effective uh, commission, in my view. It's a very independent commission. Uh, it has a wide range of, you know, various interests. You know, there are judges, there are lawyers, there are members of the public. Uh, so the JEC is important. Uh, many people have different views about it, but uh, as a lawyer, you know, uh, who has been there before and who observes uh, what goes on in the JEC, I think it's one of the most efficient, competent constitutional commissions in this country. My, my worry is that uh, the country is suffering from the scourge of corruption. It's uh, really um, destroying the executive branch of government. And now many are alleging that parliament is also itself smeared by corruption. It's now creeping in within the confines of the corridors of justice. Senior counsel, when people look at the Judicial Service Commission, and there's a very prominent lawyer there who is running for a position, uh, who you know well, but people will say he's been investigated for alleged criminal conduct, uh, as well as being a very active lawyer in court defending people accused of corruption. How can the public trust that such a person is not seeking a position within the Judicial Service Commission in order to gain advantage in the courtroom? You are, the point you are raising is valid. I mean, that point has bedeviled the, the Judicial Service Commission right from inception. When I was there, and uh, I never used to go to court very often, but I used to go once in a while. I mean, every lawyer will stand up and say that, you know, Ahmed is a member of the Judicial Service Commission. Why is he representing a party? Uh, but it depends on the kind of cases you take. Uh, but also, there's an assumption you are making that the judge whom you appear for, just because you are a member of the Judi Judicial Service Commission, will do as you want, or will act to your bidding, which is not the case. I mean, the judge, and if I appear before the Supreme Court, for example, and I'm a member of the Judicial Service Commission as a lawyer, the Chief Justice is a member. There is another judge who represents the Supreme Court. Uh, it doesn't mean that just because the lawyer is from the JEC, he has an influence of uh, the courts. But I agree with you. I mean, it depends on, you know, you know, the lawyer. I mean, some cases probably you should decide not to take, some cases you should take. But uh, in most cases, in my view and from my experience, there's really no harm in a lawyer who is a member of the Judicial Service Commission appearing for clients in courts. The, the reason the public is concerned and I ask the question is because it has not been often the case that a prominent commissioner is alleged to have committed a crime, uh, taken uh, to court uh, to, f to answer charges, and then the, you know, the next week he's involved in active <laughs> you know, campaigns to be at the highest uh, supervisory body of the judiciary. I, I mean, yes, sir. and I mean, I'm asking you point blank, yes, because you, you, you see... I will reply you point blank, and uh, I'm not told in his brief, but I think uh, if you look at the case for gender, his argument is that, you know, this very prosecutions the government initiates against him is because he's a very independent member of the Judicial Service Commission, that he looks at the, that he defends the judiciary, that he stands up for an independent and free judiciary that he protects the judiciary from state interference. And because the state is unable to have its way, that's why they are taking him to court. That's his argument. Well, let me ask you, because uh, people uh, know that you've been a critic sometimes of the Supreme Court, and you've raised questions about the conduct of judges, uh, the conduct of a judge within a case. And now you're not sitting at the commission. But when you are sitting there, it would be very awkward for you to stand, I would imagine, in the Supreme Court and be able to canvass uh, your, your views uh, with, with some form of independence. Uh, do, do you feel that somehow... No, no, I agree. I agree with you. But, you know, there are certain rules of conduct. I mean, for example, if there is a judge of the Supreme Court who has a disciplinary or who seeks promotion from the JSC, and then there's a lawyer who represents the lawyers in the JSC, I mean, the rules will apply that probably he should not argue that case before the Supreme Court. or. The judge may not sit. I mean, it happens sometimes when I was there that uh, certain judges apply for a position. Uh, I may appear before them, and uh, I'm one of the lawyers conducting. When there's cases like that, we recuse ourselves. We don't participate in the recruitment. 
But those are the rules. There are always rules. There are conflict of interest rules that so, apply. So, so the reason I'm pushing you yes. is because the Deputy Chief Justice, Ms. Milu, at the moment, has also appeared in court uh, with the government attempting to charge her, and I know the matter is still being canvassed in court, for alleged criminal conduct. Again, she's a senior member of the Judicial Service Commission. You will have a situation where there is a lawyer, and you've named him, I don't want to name him, but he is going to be sitting, seeking to sit there, and then you've got a Deputy Chief Justice herself uh, who is facing allegations of corruption also sitting there. Does that augur well? If you look at the mirror of the society where corruption has become such a major issue, is it the way lawyers want to appear? Is it the way you senior counsel and your few of you want the Judicial Service Commission to appear? No, no, first, uh, a point of correction is uh, Milu does not sit in court. You know, since she was charged in court, I think the, both her and probably the Chief Justice made a decision that she should sit out until her case comes to an end. So she, I don't think she sits. I've never seen her sit. She, or if she sits, maybe rarely when there's lack of quorum or because of necessity. But I agree with you. I mean, uh, uh, you rightly said that the executive is almost killed by corruption. So is the legislature. Uh, the judiciary doesn't fare much better, but it's a little bit better than those two arms of government. And uh, I think it's upon everybody, you know, whether you're in the JAC, whether you're a lawyer, whether you are a judge, to ensure that corruption, you know, the corruption in the judiciary is different from the corruption in the other uh, branches of government. Because when corruption occurs in the judiciary, you know, you are taking people's rights, you are taking people's liberties, you are taking people's properties. So it's very important uh, that. Uh, there is, you know, a cohesive fight against Be Because keen observers of the judiciary will notice Nancy Baraza uh, was removed as Deputy Chief Justice, and people would argue for less. Uh, and I I'm asking the question before I come into, the, you know, whether or not the Chief Justice should, uh, Deputy Chief Justice should have stepped aside. The question is, if you, people are wondering, what is so good in this Judicial Service Commission? that even people, uh, you know, they are fighting day and night for it. And, 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 and <laughs> you, you no, have been there yourself. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, the I mean. Judicial Service Commission is a very powerful and important constitutional commission. And because it is very powerful and important, the state or the government has no influence over it. Of course, the president can appoint two members, but uh, I'm, I can tell you for free that the government realized that even when they appoint the two members, those two members are still do not have much influence. And those two members, you know, are not like youth wingers of the government. I mean, these are, you know, these are professionals, retired, I mean, scholars, and they are reasonable Kenyans. So they will not do the government speeding or the way the government wants them to act. So because the government has so little influence in the JEC, that means the government has so little influence in the judiciary. And that is what is driving the political players in this country nuts, because the JEC appoints the Chief Justice. It appoints the judge of the Supreme Court and all other judges. So you have like, in our case, you have a president, you know, Uhuru. I mean, he's a powerful man. But one place where he's important is when it comes to the judiciary. And that is why when you hear all these noises about the judiciary from the executive or the legislature, it's because they know that there is nothing they can do about this institution. Now, on the issue of the principle of standing aside, do you think when a judge is implicated in an issue of corruption uh, or, uh, or alleged to have committed uh, corruption that they should step aside from their position until cleared of that charge? And I say this particularly on the case involving the Deputy Chief Justice. Do you think it would have been more appropriate for her to step aside until she's cleared of any charge? You see, we, we are holding the judiciary to standards that apply to politicians or the executive. When you are a member of the executive and you for example, your hand is found in the till or you are involved in corruption, the president can either fire you or he can tell you to step aside then as they investigate. The judiciary is a constitutional body that has security of tenor. What can happen and what should happen is that the JAC should take over that process, expedite it. They have their own tunnel mechanisms. They can, tell, they can put the judge on some garden leave without listening to cases as they process that. But we should be very careful to judge the judges according to standards we judge politicians, so, which is a much lower standard. So I'm not asking judges, I'm asking you point blank, yes. the Grand Mullah. Yes. If you are sitting at the JSC today, what would you advise the body to do on the case of Philomena Mwilu? 
who is facing alleged charges of corruption. No, no, the JSC should have taken over that case, do the investigation. If they are satisfied that there is enough, you know, uh, culpability on her part, present it to the president to appoint a tribunal. So it really is uh, asking too much to leave it to a junior magistrate uh, to handle his boss, so to speak. In my view, in my view, the right process should have been the JSC to handle that issue without matter going to the... Let, let me ask you about the Law Society. You are a prominent chairman. Um, you and I have friends who have been there. Paul Muite was the chairman. What, what has happened to the Law Society? Because where uh, these problems arise, I would have expected a very credible voice to be you know, heard from the Law Society about what they think, uh, about their views, uh, particularly on such the matters we are discussing, uh, on, the, on the approach to the Deputy Chief Justice or the JSC. Where is the Law Society? Has it fallen asleep? Falling asleep may be an understatement. <laughs> it, may have, it, may, it may have died, actually. You see, the Law Society, which I was chairman about uh, 12, 13 years ago, is very different from the current Law Society. I mean, that Law Society was much smaller. Uh, uh, I think we were about three, 4,000. Now we are about 15,000 uh, lawyers. Uh, this, this society is much younger. They are young lawyers, you know, guys, I think, uh, below 25 years, those are the majority lawyers. Uh, the standards have gone down. I mean, there are so many faculties everywhere. You know, that time we had only the University of Nairobi or you go to England or India. Those were the only three places you could go. Now there's all kind of universities, you know, universities that don't have even a library that is, you know, five meters by five meters are teaching law. We have teachers, you know, now, I mean, who are not that uh, well trained. So we have all... I mean, the legal profession has a lot of problems, and that's now easily reflected in the law society. And that's why even, you know, uh, we had an instance, I think, the law society where the chairman of the law society, or the president, as we call him now, you know, give us a policy position. So that, you know, it, uh, it lets Kenyans know that this is the position of the law society. And then you have a council member who will issue a contrary statement and say that, no, this is also my view. So, I mean, there's a lot of problems. So, so um, um, Senior Counsel, it's very interesting because um, you're raising a very serious matter. You're talking about the standards of uh, the, the current uh, teaching um, for lawyers in Kenya. Uh, you are concerned that the standards are falling way below. No, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that, there's no doubt about that because, uh, I mean, when I was in the JC, I mean, there are many times we interviewed young lawyers and, you see, and when you ask them, you know, basic principles of law, you know, principles I remember from my days in first year or second year, and they can't remember. I mean, this, you know, like asking a student 10 plus 10, and he can't answer you, that should worry, and it worries a lot. I mean, if you, even advocacy, if you see the standard of advocacy, you know, the lawyers Kenya had in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I mean, there's a lot of difference. The standards have, you know, so would, know, you, would, you, would you then agree with the current um, uh, secretary of the cabinet uh, who is trying to say we need to review our degrees and the quality of, of the teaching at the higher levels, higher institutions of learning? Uh, I, I mean, this sounds very but that serious. Has been, you know, when did the rain start beating Kenyans in terms of education standards? Is when they brought, you know, these uh, parallel programs. You know, guys you left in the villages in the 70s or 80s who had Division Four or failed, who are suddenly going to universities. I have no problem, I mean, I have, yeah. I have no problem with giving someone a second chance, yes. you know, so that they can further the education. But when, you ha when they started the parallel programs, where even there were instances of someone going and getting a degree without stepping into a class even for a day, I mean, how can we, not, how can we now complain about the standards going so, down? So, Grand Mura, I, I want to ask you point blank. The school of law, was always meant to be there to be the protector of the public. In fact, the ego eye uh, to make sure that whoever had been called a lawyer is double tested. W what has happened to? I mean, look, like all institutions in the country, you know, the school of law faces many challenges. It's uh, fallen on hard times. The students, the numbers are just huge. Uh, 10 years ago, the school of law used to handle like 300, 400 students a year. Nowadays, it's 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 2,000. I mean, they don't have the capacity, you know, to teach or to train or to ensure that these 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 students are properly qualified to be released 
and practice law. So um, point blank, what is the solution to the ongoing crisis uh, and how as a, you know, a former chairman of the Law Society, as a member of the Judicial Service Commission, former member, what would you advise, what would you prescribe uh, as needs to be done? I think the most important prescription, and I think this will come as a matter of course very soon, is that law should be a graduate degree, you know, like it is in many countries, America, Canada, and some other jurisdictions. Law, in my view, an 18-year-old student should not do a law degree. I mean, law should be a graduate degree. You do one degree in the arts or in the science. Then you do when you're a little bit mature and you're 24 or 25 years or higher. So um, you are looking at uh, an overhauling of the system. There, there seems to be um, new energy in the uh, docket of education uh, since the appointment of the new cabinet secretary. Uh, would you seek out the cabinet secretary and uh, give your viewpoints? Be because obviously uh, the country will rely on you and your colleagues who are senior counsel uh, to, to, to give direction. You know, I disagree. When you hear, like, uh, there are ministers who have a lot of energy, like education or, in, you know, interior. I mean, they're doing very well. I have no problem with that. But, you know, we, we are substituting the energy of an individual for institutions that have broken down. Systems have broken down in this country. Institutions have broken down. Processes and procedures have disappeared. So when you have a very strong minister, you know, you know a bully sort of, like, you know, Someone who will, who will, who will, who will uh, override everything by sheer personality. That's not a solution. That just shows you that this country faces a solution, a, a problem that it has no idea how to fix. And because the systems and the processes and procedures have collapsed, the institutions have collapsed, you think this strong man, because of his personality, will cure. No, that is cosmetic curing. When you look across the region, Uganda, Tanzania, um, the East African region, even Africa, where do you rate um, where we are? No, no, we are doing very well, I mean, but you know, I mean, we should not compare ourselves with Uganda, Tanzania, or Rwanda, because uh, unlike those countries, uh, we have a very strong constitution, you know, we fought for a constitution for 20 years, and no country in the region has. Because our constitutional substructure is very strong, we are on a very strong pedestal when you compare us to those countries. And we should not compare ourselves with those countries. So maybe only South Africa? Would yes, you... yes, South Africa, you know, Botswana, those kind of countries, you know, Mauritius. Yes. Yes. I wanted to ask you then about the bench itself. Yes. We're talking about, you know, of course, if you have garbage in, garbage out. Yes, yes. But what is the quality, for right from the magistrates down there, upward? What are the, in your humble view, What's the caliber of people we have, uh, you know, uh, on the bench? You know, I mean, the good thing is uh, <laughs> I recruited the uh, judges right from the magistrates to the Supreme Court. And, uh, I mean, they are very, they are excellent judges in the High Court, you know, amazing judges in the High Court. I mean, they are excellent judges in the Court of Appeal, amazing, you know, uh, guys who can, in my view, uh, the judges we have in the High Court and the Court of Appeal can you know, stand up anyway. Uh, and, but, and, but, and therefore their judgments generally, you read a lot of yes, law. Yes, their judgments are solid, they are read everywhere. I mean, uh, you will see a court in South Africa, you know, court in this. The Supreme Court has been very disappointing for me. And uh, I'll come back yes. to the Supreme Court in the next segment. Substantively. But I just want, yeah, but gen yeah, substantively. But generally, would you say that, we are, that most Kenyans are getting a fair hearing and, and, and a fair judgment? Yes, yes, yes. Across the courts? Yes, yes. They're, they're, they're very, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of corruption in our courts. Yeah. There's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of, you know, interference, there's a lot of well, hunky-punky, monkey business, a lot of things. But they're very good judges, you know, they're very good judges, they're honest judges, they're guys who work their part off, you know, really, and deliver justice. And uh, I have mentioned those two courts, they're amazing judges in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, who are doing wonderful So jobs. if you like to speak about jurisprudence, uh, has it, what is, how has the development uh, of our jurisprudence been encouraging from where you sit? Yes, yes. In certain courts, I mean, if you look at, the, for example, of course, it depends on, you know, the judge. But if you look at the history of the constitutional court, right from the inception, I think 2010 to now, and you look at the judicial review, you know, uh, division of the high court, I mean, those courts have done an amazing job. And if you look at the court of appeal in the last, you know, 10 years, the court of appeal also have been solid ground. 
And then uh, I wanted to ask then, if the law society remains a weak institution and um, lawyers don't um, have a body that can be able to uh, keep up those standards, like the law reports and so forth, uh, what would be your advice on strengthening uh, a useful uh, society? Is it for older people like yourselves in, the, in terms of the profession to get more involved? There's a feeling, my own view is that the bigger names are not involved. No, no, that's true. I think that's true. I mean, and that's one of the weaknesses of the law society is that, you know, older lawyers like myself or even guys who are older than me have taken a back seat, you know, left to the profession to young guys. Uh, but because, you know, I mean... So there should have been some seats preserved, would you yes, not say, yes, but for you wiser... See, it's about numbers, you know? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's about numbers. And uh, the young members of the society have the numbers. And even sometimes they elected... The, uh, let me give you an example. There's a time we had uh, Okoa Law Society. They brought this idea that, you know, the law society is in a crisis. And some young lawyers brought, you know, they said, we want the ex to be the president, deputy president. And they took over the whole society. And within six months, you know, there was chaos, you know. Mm -hmm. They completely disintegrated and uh, eventually, you know, they become the laughing stock of the society. Yeah, because the numbers are with the younger, yes, yes. Uh, younger lawyers yes. and so on. In other jurisdictions like the UK and Canada, are the, is it the same form of election? Is it by numbers or is there a, a certain format that is different? I mean, it's the same. I mean, it's, uh, it's always numbers, but, you know, those guys are, some of those jurisdictions is... I mean, you have to do law as a graduate. People are much older. People are more oh, have better see. training. Yes. People are more sober. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of dynamics. Well, you are Just as their politics is more advanced than ours, yes. their legal profession is also as more advanced than ours. Well, you're watching uh, Point Blank here at KTN News. The Grand Mullah says that um, the Judicial Service Commission should have handled the case of the Deputy Chief Justice and that the Law Society of Kenya is on its deathbed. This is KTN News. Good evening, Point Blank here at KTN News. Uh, Senior Counsel, I wanted to jump uh, up into um, the Supreme Court. Um, Kenyans may not know that you are a passionate proponent of the creation of a Supreme Court uh, that came about uh, the 2010 Constitution. Uh, what do you think about your baby now that it was born? <laughs> <laughs> it was just not my baby. It was actually the baby of the law site of Kenya for many years. And the rationale lawyers used to advance for the creation of the Supreme Court were two. One is that they said the Court of Appeal became a very corrupt court. There was a lot of corruption, there were people were pulling deals here and there. The second reason they said is that the, the Court of Appeal failed to develop good jurisprudence that could guide lower courts. So for many years, the law society pushed the agenda that we need a, court of, a higher court, an apex court, manned by the best Kenyans, the most qualified, men and women of integrity, and then we give that court an opportunity now to set the standard in terms of jurisprudence, guide the lower courts, and also provide an example of integrity, how a judge should behave. Unfortunately, I can tell you, dear, 10 years down the road, the Supreme Court is one of the worst courts in this country. It has failed to develop any law. There is nothing sensible in terms of jurisprudence that comes of, out of that court. Integrity, I mean, you guys read the papers, what's happening every day. It's a court, in my view, I mean, in my, in my considered view, there is no way we can have this court as currently constituted in the year 2022. I we want can. to ask you, um, point blank, under Willy Mutunga, under David Magara, um, Maraga, is this the same view you hold then in totality of the years, or is there a problem arising now? No, no, no. I mean, be, 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 my, my, my view has evolved like many things. I mean, when, 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 uh, when Willy Mutunga was judge of the Supreme Court, when the president of the court and chief justice, I mean, the Supreme Court was a very, very competent court. 
I mean, if you look at the cases they decided when Willie was there, either on constitutional interpretation or an election petitions, the court was on a very sound basis. Under the presence of Maraga, when, when Maraga came, he came with two other new judges. So the court was completely reconstituted. When Willie left and Maraga came, we had three new judges in the Supreme Court. So almost 50% of the courts was new. So the courts in terms of composition changed a lot. But I think the turning point for the court was the presidential election in 2017, when they nullified uh, Uhuru's win. I think that is when the court, you know, was engulfed in whether it was independent, whether it, could, whether it was playing politics, whether it was doing this. And many people, I, of course, uh, you know, the day they announced, you know, I said that, I stood up and said that this is a political case. You have not decided according to the law. But many Kenyans gave them, you know, the benefit of doubt to see whether they will carry the rationale of the Raila case to other court cases. And I can tell you for free that when they decided cases last five months, six months, like governors, they completely turned around now. They completely turned around. The, case, the rationale which they nullified the Uhuru win in the first case, now they have changed it completely. Now, they said that's no longer the law. So when you say they, uh, there's a case of following individual justices uh, at the Supreme Court. Do they write individual judgments that you can scrutinize, that these are the judgments of Joki Domo, these are the judgments of Ibrahim, these are the judgments of um, Maraga, for example. Is there, um, in most jurisdictions, yes, uh, you're, you're meant to, to write your own? Actually, in 99%, they write just one judgment for the court, so you don't know where a particular judge stands in a matter. Uh, but I agree with you, in many jurisdictions, you know, every judge writes his own. And even when there is a unanimity on a certain positions, judges still write their concurrent judgments. So in Kenya, the judge... Point blank, senior yes. counsel, are you saying the Supreme Court is lazy? Are you saying the Supreme Court just doesn't uh, care? Or why would there be that? Why would the Chief Justice allow a situation where you cannot even test uh, what one justice has said so that people can be able to review it's in their own... It's a culture. I mean, the Supreme Court is everything bad, eh? Yes, not just lazy. But uh, the Supreme Court, it takes three, four years to hear a very small case, you know. Uh, it has a backlog <laughs> when, if you go to the registry, it, <laughs> it has only 60 cases or 70 cases that are filed. But it still takes five years or six years or three years. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, institutional weaknesses. So, so you know, you know, Grand Mula, Kenyans know you talk straight. So I have to ask you point blank. You're saying when Willie was Chief Justice that there was a better performance from the court. Are you alleging? that the problem right now is the president of the Supreme Court or his management style. No, no, why would there oh, be... Absolutely. I mean, I, I, mean, I, say point blank. Point, I will answer your point blank. There, there's a world of difference between the Mutungo Court and the Maraca Court. I mean, uh, in terms of efficiency, in terms of jurisprudence, in terms of ethics, in terms of everything, the court has changed dramatically for the worse. That's what I'm saying. And I'm asking this because in two years, the exit of Maraca comes. And this is the issue that I was asking to you in the first segment about the Judicial Service Commission. Because we are now going to be looking for the third person, the third occupant, to be president of the Supreme Court and the head of the judiciary. Uh, what are the characteristics that we should be looking for? And do we have the men and women in this country who can step up to where you think Mutunga left it? You know, I, I can tell you this because I participated in the first recruitment of, uh, of uh, William Mutunga. The Constitution now creates, when, when we appoint Chief Justice, now we give him two hats to wear. One is head of the judiciary, and that's administrative, you know, the PR he gives, you know, the statements, the functions he attends. But the more important function for the Chief Justice is the President of the Court, the Supreme Court. That is his main function. That is his main duty. That is his main obligation. And that's where the challenge lies in this country. But, but Grand Buddha, this kind of chief justice is in Kisi. <laughs> I mean, look, I, let me, I saw him receive a huru and I mean, how would you make, honestly? You know, that is something Will will never have done, you know. I, I mean, I mean, I, I don't mind. I, I mean, he can, I have a problem with the chief justice attending a rally, uh, especially a rally in rural Kenya. <laughs> or in Nairobi for in that In his but, hometown. But you see... The, <laughs> you see, it's not a national... No, no, the most important function for the Chief Justice is the President of the Supreme Court. Because 
And his main role is, you know, developing the law, jurisprudence, you know, guiding the lower courts, showing consistency. You know, there's something called stare decisis. Making, you know, when you make a decision in England or in America or in developed democracies, a court will never really, I mean, in the American Supreme Court's president, uh, all 100 years, 50 years, 70 years, you know, it's the greatest shame for a court to depart from a previous decision without a solid grounds. The Supreme Court of Kenya has turned the law topsy turvy. It you know, the decisions it makes today, then three days later it departs from the decision. And there are certain dynamics that force a court to depart from its previous decision. And decisions. what would be the impact of that to the lower court? I no, mean, it's to the court of appeal to the highest? It's chaos. There's no law in the country now. There's no law. Are we not a common English common law, a, a, a jurisdiction of, um, of president? That was destroyed by the Maraga court. The Maraga court does not adhere to its terror decisis. Uh, you know why I'm asking? I, I have to put your back on the wall on this. I saw the Kisi tape and I asked myself, how can the president of the Supreme Court be thanking the president for coming to help the people of Kisi? I, and I asked that because if that's how the president of the Supreme Court sees his role, uh, as coming from a region, how will he serve the nation? And I put it to you as... as I don't know. I mean, that even is, you know, that also sends a very strong signal to a person like Uhuru, I mean, or to the deputy president or even to Raila, that the chief justice attended my rally. He's my subordinate, you know? I mean, that's a, that's, that's a very unfortunate statement, but it's a statement that can be read. When the chief justice attend a rally organized so, by the president, it sends a signal to the president that this is a man I can invite him for a cup of tea. But this time. is why I was asking you earlier about the Judicial Service Commission, Senior Counsel, point blank. Because who then can rein in if we allow the Judicial Service Commission to become another talking shop, to become a place where people can dump uh, their frustrations in order to be able to assert influence downward? <laughs> who, who then? Where will Kenyans... No, no, actually, to give the credit, I'm sure that the Judicial Service Commission has rested that issue with the Chief Justice because... When events like that happen, the Judicial Service Commission can question the Chief Justice why he attended a rally like that. Because, I mean, it has the powers to reprimand him. Yes. Now, if you look at the uh, 2010 Constitution and the fact that it created the Supreme Court, it means that if you want change in the composition, uh, in, the, in the written law that gives life uh, to the Supreme Court, would you suggest anything that you see that can be done in a referendum that can strengthen, alter, um, improve? No, no, you see, I mean, there's a very strong argument that can be made for reconstituting the Supreme Court, but it's dangerous in my view, and we should not make it. It's better to live with these guys and see how to remove them without amending the Constitution and then removing them. You know, we have tried the radical surgery, we have tried vetting, they have all failed. Uh, it is very difficult, you know, to, to cure these ailments that so afflict the So you're talking more of the people of the Supreme yes, Court, yes, yes. not the court itself? No, no, the court is perfect. So, so, so let me say this to you. Already there is uh, one judge who is facing a tribunal. Yes, yes. Uh, I heard some rumors that there could be... Have you had anything going on in terms of uh, anybody else uh, uh, or uh, anybody else in the judiciary at high level? Have you... There are rumors always we hear as lawyers. <laughs> but you're the grand but, mullah. But <laughs> you, you, you. We, we hear rumors that there may be another one yes. from the Supreme Court that may be also suspended. But there are rumors, you know, we don't know. I'm, I don't sit. Nobody, so, gives, so, 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 nobody so, gives me the uh, minutes of the JC no, no, anymore. But I'm asking the question because you, you said that you wrote a letter uh, Kenyans may or may not have known um, that it was carried in the press that you yourself was raising concern with certain individuals, were they at the Supreme Court or below? No, no, that's a public, I mean, it's in the public. We, I mean, my client raised that issue, a formal uh, petition was for, filed. For the purposes of our viewers, yes, what yes. was your letter and what were you saying in that letter? No, no, we, they were complaining about one of the cases that was handled by the court. We were not happy and I think we had very strong uh, grounds why so we were not happy. Did you name specifically point blank yes, who, yes, yes, which, yes. Law, which yes, judges? Yes, yes. Uh, are you able to name them? No, no, no. But is it a letter that is before the Judicial yes, Service yes, Commission? Yes, yes. Uh, what number of judges did you raise? I think four, four. Of uh, the Supreme Court? Yes, yes. And you are alleging that it is not just misconduct, you are alleging no, corruption? No, no, we, they were, we, we, for what two, it, yes. uh, 
the allegations were corruption, and for two, the allegations was, you know, lack of independence or incompetence, those kind of complaints. Now, your client was raising the issue through you, but yourself have a duty as senior counsel uh, to raise only issues that you think can help the administration of justice. Absolutely, that's why and, we raised it. And I'm asking you, yes. in your, in, whether your conscience is clear, that you raised oh, a bona fide issue, absolutely, and that what you are raising is a matter in the public interest. Absolutely, I mean we, I mean, I've been involved in judicial reforms for long. I, there is no law in this country who has been involved in judicial reforms as I was. You can take that to the bank or to an impressor shop. Eh? So, so when we raise this, we don't raise trivial issues. So we raise issues that it will help this country address the problems facing Grand the Mula. judiciary. There is one judge of the Supreme Court who is facing a tribunal. You have written a, sham a letter. Tribunal, a sham tribunal, in my view. Why a sham tribunal? Yes, because, I mean, uh, the president has appointed uh, people whom he thinks will acquit uh, the judge. You see, if you look at the caliber of judge of, of members of a tribunal appointed by Kibaki when they investigated Nancy Praza, I mean, he appointed a, you know, a retired judge of the Supreme Court of, I mean, a retired chief justice from Tanzania, very, you know, qualified Kenyans, very qualified regions. But you see, I mean, here you appoint a judge of the Court of Appeal to investigate a judge of the Supreme Court. You appoint some uh, Jubilee. I mean, I support Jubilee, I have no problem to express my view. But you appoint Jubilee, you know, what do I call them? I mean, they, so, <laughs> you know, they probably find the, find the right one. Yeah. But you know, the government is fixing certain tribunals. And it is a very sad situation because when you are doing a constitutional process, you must ensure, protect the integrity of a constitutional process. I, I'm asking you this because that judge who is before the tribunal, and then you have written a letter naming another four, you are really talking about 70% of the court. Because five out of seven is really... <laughs> It's frightening. Yes, yes, but, but, no, no, but senior counsel, I'm putting it to you. Yes, what sir. are you saying to the country is that 70% of the Supreme Court is rotten? No, no. If, I mean, you know, let me tell you, I mean, you, I have said it and I will repeat it. This Supreme Court we have today is not fit for purpose. We are wasting our time with that court. It is the right time to address how we should find a solution for that. I, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm an idealist, sort of, because I formed that court. I mean, I was part of the construction team that put it together. And, uh, uh, I mean, you know, from the Chief Justice William Mutunga up to the guy, the seventh guy, I mean, I participated in the process. And I feel sad about it because it's an experiment, you know, we thought we did our best, but it's failed. The experiment has failed. Now, coming to corruption, Glanmura, the country is bleeding. Uh, the amount of money that is being looted from the county to the national government on a daily basis is absolutely mind-boggling. Are you shaken by the, by the audacity, by the, I don't know, want to use the word courage, the, but it is massive. No, but why, why should you be shaken? Why? I, are you shaken? I'm not. Because it's the norm. You know, if it was, uh, if it was something that <laughs> suddenly happens, I would have been shaken. But it's the norm for, for people in power to steal from the state. It's the norm. I mean, I don't know what all this noise is about. I mean, that's the norm. That's the status quo. I'm surprised that, you know, for example, Uri is saying that he wants to fight corruption. I mean, why does he want to fight it? It's the norm. Are you saying that President Kenyatta's uh, fight on corruption is insincere? No, no, it is, in my view it's a sham, you know. In, it's not his job first. Eh? Why should the president lead the fight against the corruption? That is not his job. If you look at the job description of the president as the head of the executive, as the president of this country, fighting corruption is not his core business. It's not his business. That he is fighting corruption means certain institutions Certain office that were created by the Constitution or other statutes have failed. So instead of building those institutions, 
the president has taken over a war that's not his. But is it just really fair to say it's the president? Because I was asking you about the law society. Because under section four, is it of the... Of the law society act. Of the law society act. The law society is meant to also be a moral compass. No, I agree with you. I mean, it provides guidance, some political views. So if Uhuru is failing, are, are you not failing as lawyers in the law society? Are you also... Because who is going to... No, no, but uh, Tony, everybody has a function in this country. The president is the president of the country. He is the commander in chief. He has certain functions, but there are certain institutions that are supposed to fight corruption. Those institutions have failed. I understand the president's frustration. I mean, the pack stops with him. You know, at the end, he is frustrated. He knows that he is not. He knows that uh, certain institutions are not working. He is trying to help, but in my view, and respectfully, he is going the wrong way. So, are you telling Kenyans we go like Sudan? Basi twende kwa barabara. Siafadali, we will go there. <laughs> we are ready. <laughs> because <laughs> because it, it seems to me that from the state of the nation, there is a sense of hopelessness. There is a sense of inability. I do not know. And you know the president is my friend. But I can't understand. Do you, Dan Mura, understand? What no, no, I understand, I understand the president's frustrations. And the president thinks that this is something that needs quick fix. I think he's completely mistaken. You can't address the problem of corruption in a quick fix he wants. But that you was the whole idea of the handshake. The whole idea, Glenn of the handshake. You know, the, the handshake is, you know, even the handshake is being mishandled, you know. You know, you know that. The handshake is like, uh, you know, the French sometimes when they form certain political cohabitation. It's mm. more of a cohabitation. I think the right word is that. Mm. It's not really a handshake. It's like, you know, a cohabitation between two politicians. But the, the handshake will not address corruption because how, how will it address? It was meant to, I, uh, well, the arguments for it was that there will be calmness and there will be political um, opportunity created by the lack of... Calmness uh, is there and I think it is welcome. I mean, the political temperature has gone down, but the, you know, the, I mean, you have to understand that the biggest problem facing Kenya is that institutions have failed. So whether there is handshake, farm or not farm... But your critics, uh, Grand Mula, the people say that, look, once you charge a person A and you take them to the court, he walks in with the 10 lawyers led by you or senior counsel, and the magistrate, even before charges can be read, <laughs> the lawyers are there, 20, 30, but let for me one month. Now, let me tell you the truth now, <laughs> eh? as a lawyer. And we know about this and we talk as lawyers. 80% of those cases are useless. They should not be even brought to court in the first place. Either the evidence is weak or there's nothing. I mean, I've done cases where you know, where the prosecution will bring 20 cases and you don't even cross-examine because they are saying nothing. Well, I don't even know whether you can discuss your clients, but you have been very prominent uh, with some of the biggest cases. I mean, um, if you look at something like Aglolisin, for example, the media and everything, you know, people were talking about billions and billions. And I noticed you are one of the lawyers <laughs> in the case. And, and, you know, as a respected person, when people see you there, just the fact that you lend your name to defending the allegation, people see as though, look, what's going on? Now, Why? Now, now <laughs> let me tell you, Angulo Lisin exploded when I was chairman of the Law Society of Kenya. Yes. And, uh, you know, I gave thousands of press statements, you know, these. We even went to court to charge Amos Wako and two other guys on Angulo Lisin. And uh, Amos Wako entered a knowledge prosecute. So later on, when some clients approached me, I told them, no, no, I have a long history with Angulo Lisin. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there is this theft that has occurred. I think you have to show me the evidence you have before I can even become your lawyer. So we went through all this. Then I was convinced that I can act for them. I don't want to go into the case because the case is at the tail end, you know, both cases, they are coming to an end and I don't want to talk anything that will either embarrass the court or prejudice the case. But let me tell you, some of the cases we have done about 40 witnesses, like 15 we have not even cross-examined them. There's nothing to ask them. Another 15, <laughs> Amos Wako was a witness, Madaura is a witness, many other witnesses, all of them will tell you that there is nothing wrong with Anglo-Lisin. So I understand that uh, you can't talk much about Anglo-Lisin, yes. but uh, I needed to bring it out there that uh, respected as you are, you're among the lawyers that defend 
very serious allegations of yeah, corruption. But, uh, but the and, and there's nothing wrong with defending, but you need to accept the fact that what can these institutions do? When no, the no, DCI no, no, no. have to meet uh, the, the great uh, senior counsel in court. No. <laughs> Actually, it's a badge of honor for a lawyer to defend either a weak person or a very unpopular uh, accused person. It's a badge of honor. So you that, sleep well at night oh, representing agro I, I snow. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. There seems to be 10 or so lawyers who are known, um, and anybody, the top men who are, or women who are charged with corruption come running, and you can almost predict who the lawyers will be. Is there a cartel of you guys, senior no, no. lawyers? <laughs> so after they loot the public, they come to you. No, no, no. <laughs> in Kenya, million. I mean, in Kenya, you know, the, Kenya, the bar has very good lawyers, you know. I mean, they are, they are lawyers. They are some amazing lawyers. I mean, my learned, my friend Paul Mitte, for example, I mean, he has been practicing for 50 years or 40 years. He's an amazing lawyer, you know. He's very competent. He has done many things. People like Fred Ngatia, George Oraro, you know, we have, you know, the cream de la cream. So, I mean, the Kenyan bar has very, very good lawyers. So sometimes... When a man is in problem, he knows where to go. Not because there's a cartel, but because he knows that the evidence that is, uh, he's facing and the kind of lawyers he instructs, he has a good fighting chance. I mean, I'm not talking about the lawyers who do, you know, drugs or some small things or, you know, this, the lawyers who appear as a mob. But there are many, I mean, they, have, they are very fine lawyers in the profession who judge top dollar and who do excellent job. Well, uh, senior counsel um, Glenn Muller says that uh, the evidence in many corruption cases is weak. He says that the Supreme Court of Kenya needs to be overhauled. This is Point Blank here at KTN News. This is a point blank at KTN News. The Grand Mullah is uh, saying it as it is. Um, senior counsel, this issue of corruption, um, you say that uh, Uhuru, it's not his job. You say that the institutions are bringing uh, poor evidence to court. What are you telling Kenyans to do? Uh, you say we can even go to the streets like Sudan. What is the way we can actually effectively deal with this uh, corruption? No, no, you know, first I support the war against corruption led by the president because, as I told you, he's going the wrong way, but I understand it's out of frustration. And he wants to achieve this, he wants to help the public recover this, but the strategy is completely wrong in my view. And my view is that you know, there's a department in the Attorney General uh, headed by a good lady, very well experienced lawyer called Mudoni Kimani, that's in charge of asset recovery and this. And the easiest way to recover all this stolen property is to do this lifestyle audit that the president has shelved. Let him start with his cabinet ministers and say that, you know, X, this is the assets you have. This is the salaries you earned. You don't have a rich father. I mean, you are a very poor man all your life before you are taken from this minister of treasury. Account to this. And actually, the law is that when you follow that procedure, the onus is on the minister or the person who is accounted. Then the law is that if he doesn't account, the government takes it the next day. That is the way to recover all this stolen property. You, you, you know, even in the village, when you see somebody landing in a chopper, and he's your MP, first time MPs here in Central, they land in choppers. No, no, actually, I advised the president <laughs> through my Twitter, I tagged him. I told him, uh, Wilson has about 100, 120 helicopters. It's not owned by the CEO of Buckley's Bank or Safaricom or Equity Bank because they can afford. It's owned by politicians, you know, first time MPs, some governors. Why don't you say that, you know, let's start with these helicopters at Wilson. Let everybody account how he has bought these helicopters because they are worth between 200 and a billion. Uh, each chopper. Each chopper. So, in what, it's... Two, two million dollars two to million ten million. dollars to ten million. So why don't you start the process like that? I mean, if you want to recover, let us go that way. We start with the ministers, we go with the PSs, 
we go with former ministers. So, so to answer Abba Wilson, Kapisa. <laughs> if you go just to Wilson, yes, yes, yes. you can yes. deal with that. No, no, but also we know, <laughs> for example, we know a governor building a huge, you know, hotel somewhere. Yes. You can easily go and tell him, you know, governor, what, where is this money from? Yeah, talking about Twitter, uh, I know we were covering uh, uh, this issue of uh, the people you represent. Are there some of your clients who own seven choppers? Or ten no, no, I don't know. You see. <laughs> no, you, you know, I have to ask the question because <laughs> people are saying that it's not just one chopper. You can have an individual who's got seven, six of them, you know, literally parked at Wilson. For you uh, to shame a name, where will it reach a point where some of us will be, begin to have distance with some of them? We, will it reach no, a point no, where... No, no, but, we, but the point I think I'm making is the evidence of corruption is overwhelming. Yes. It's everywhere. Yes. Everybody can see. I mean, the president, the, as the head of the state, I mean, the intelligence, you know, the police, they give him all this evidence. Today, he knows if a minister's account, there's money that hits, the president can know. You know why I'm asking you the hard question? Yes. Will there reach a point where lawyers say, I will not represent this money? No, no, I can tell you for free. Uh, there are so many cases we don't take. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. There, I mean, <laughs> you don't just take because the guy has money. No, no, no. There are many cases, including myself, there are cases I refuse to take because either the theft is so clear or you know that this guy has either no defense or, you know, he doesn't satisfy some of the criteria you take him through when he's in a structure. Because, because so there are many cases we turn down. Yeah, because what I'm asking you that is when an ordinary MP walks into your office and uh, you, you don't come in cheap. You mentioned Paul Mwite and the others. You don't come in cheap. That's true. Five, ten million, just deposit instructions. I know, I've walked into your office, so, so I know it is heavy. So my question is, when a man like that walks in, and you can see this man earns 800,000 a month, and even the fees is 10 million, or five, how can he afford it? Yes, so I clearly... Mean, but, he, the, but as I say, said, lawyers turn down many cases on ethical grounds, or some other considerations. In, in other jurisdictions where money is frozen and so forth, in the US and the UK, you report money through the banking system. Anything beyond $5,000, $10,000 is investigated and uh, sometimes it handed over to the CID. Uh, is, is it lawful now? Are, are banks being required to report? Yeah, I mean, you see, in, in, I mean, the banking sector in Kenya is very sophisticated. I mean, it's not, we are not a banana republic. The central bank knows any, every day if a penny comes to my account, whether it's a client account or office account. It knows how much, for example, money I hold in my account. It knows all the money. So if they are very serious, which they are not, they can easily know where is money being held, what are the circumstances under which it's held, do they need to investigate. So let me tell you, I mean, if you have a serious government that wants to fight corruption, it's so easy. It has all the apparatus, it has all the powers, it has all the institutions, but this is... Including intelligence. Of course. So of course. they would... Let me tell you, there's this allegation that lawyers are the facilitators uh, because of the client account, that apparently uh, money given to a lawyer held on behalf of a client does not meet the scrutiny that other monies are subjected to. If true, is that something that should be changed? No, no, it's not true first. I mean, it's true that lawyers are exempted from certain reportings under the Money Laundering Act. That's true. Mm. But uh, there are certain jurisdictions, I think, in America, where, or many countries, where lawyers are exempted. Eh? But if there is a paper trail, you know, and it's easy to show the paper trail. For example, if there's a minister who, has, who got a huge kickback, five billion, then he tried to give to lawyers. I mean, if it comes to my client account, the police can legitimately come to my office and say that, you know, Ahmed, there is five million that came to. We suspect it's a kickback from there, and we're investigating. And there's no way you can stop them. And even without stopping them, I'm asking you as Grand Muller, mm -hmm. where a lawyer is ethical, would you not be the person as a lawyer who would even query? Uh, you, you know, what is the... What is the responsibility of no, a lawyer? No, no, I, I agree, absolutely. <laughs> there, are many, I can't, there are many transactions we reviews, lawyers reviews. I speak for myself, but I also speak for many lawyers. There are many instances where lawyers refuse and say that, no, this money can't come to me. I will not accept it. Go somewhere else. Because I'm asking that because, you know, even with terrorism, 
and with all this, uh, corruption is, is, is broad. It's not just stealing from the state or stealing from institutions. Some of it is even used for criminal yes. activity, drugs, uh, even, even, even terror, terror itself. Uh, what, what is the role of but, a law? But, but uh, Tony, let me take you back a little bit. If someone wants to transfer a billion shillings to my account, Central Bank will stop it. Yes, those are the rules. I mean, they have stopped it two weeks ago. They ask you, where is this money coming from? Then you have to explain and say that this money is coming from a court case. Uh, we have handled and we settled and this is the judgment and this is, then they release it. So the central bank knows this. One, of course, nowadays people may be carrying money in dollars and those kind of things. But if there is a huge transactions and there are kickbacks going through the banking system, oh, it's very easy, it's very easy. Another trend, uh, Glenn Mura, that has uh, begun is this thing of safety deposit box. I have a very good friend of mine who's a CEO of, the, of one of the largest banks in Kenya. And he was telling me they are very concerned about whether they want to continue having this safety deposit box. Because when somebody walks in and they ask for their box, if they were an nanny, Nobody knows. You saw that case where allegedly two billion uh, was, money. was found uh, of fake yes, money. Yes, but I, I think... Uh, as, what as, are the regulations, uh, if any? You know, as problems like that develop, the banks will always find solutions. And I agree with you that, I mean, if there is this problem now of how do you handle this uh, face, uh, safe deposits, which you have little control in terms of what goes in. Yeah, because a corrupt person will start buying dollars, yes. the bigger bills, $100 bills and so on, and keep them in safety deposit because they know their house will be raided. You, 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 no, no, you know, I, obvious. I, I think, I think uh, they dig holes in their houses nowadays. That's where they keep the money. Basi kinoti ya meskia. So, mutu anachima. Anaweka, I watch this, Esca, es, what do you call, pa, pala, plad, what do you call this man of Colombia? The yes, drug yes. lord. El, uh, Escobar. Uh, Escobar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was <laughs> digging. <laughs> but so, I think that's what they're doing in Kenya, and probably it's the right time we get uh, so, so, these, uh, these machines that can x-ray certain houses. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wanted to ask you then, in terms of... Um, the uh, turning around of an economy. Singapore, uh, I mean, uh, not, case, Rwanda is uh, uh, doing some incredible things. Is there, uh, in your view, uh, the political will, is there opportunity to, to really turn this thing b b know, before it, the I next mean, election? It, it's, it's so simple, eh? but it needs a serious decision to be made by the people who wield power in this country. You know, nowadays, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the leaders, you know, in America, you will, in America or Europe or even Asia, most of Asia, you will not see the president and his cabinet stealing. It's not there. It's no longer there. I mean, that's, it's old. Because they don't do business. But in Kenya and in many African countries, the people who will power is in business, you know, you can have a newspaper, you can have an insurance. When you separate, and I think the president made that point recently, he said that they will bring a legislation that when you are in government, you cannot do business. The only money that comes to your account is salary. If your salary is little, you resign, then you do your job so that you can make a lot of money. When you come to government, you must know that you will make very little money. And even you will not afford to pay your kids unless the state pays for you. So we must make that decision. You know the Indigo Commission of the 70s that said you can do both that is where the problem lies in a country like Kenya. You must separate. It was if you are the president, we must know that Uhuru receives 1.5 or 2 million in his account. Yes. He doesn't get shares from his banks. And we know that the deputy president, that's what he gets, the chief justice. But if we allow, for example, <coughs> I'm a judge of the Supreme Court, and I have safari com shops, I go collect, I mean... <laughs> You can't, you can't fight corruption. This was the old argument about doctors who work for government not being allowed to have a private practice because they would have work in the government up to five. And then by six, they open a clinic. Yes, it's like, it will be like a lawyer working for the AG. Then at five, he opens an office in the practice. <laughs> no, no. If we want us to fight, if we, go, if, we, if we want Kenya to go Singapore way or, you know, you must ensure that the civil servants don't do business. Because I, I know a lot of leaders listen to you, um, there is a new opening in the country. 
at the State of the Nation, the President had five or six leaders of political parties present. Musalia Mudavadi was there, Moses Watangula was there, Kalonzo Musioka was there, the other day Mother Karua was here. And it seems to me that almost the entire leadership, uh, opposition and government is in to fight the monster of corruption. Senior Council, if Uhuru is watching you today, and he's got three more years before he retires. Um, Zeraila Odinga is also watching you. He is now a senior citizen in his 70s. They need to leave a, a hallmark or leave uh, a legacy. What would you say to them on this corruption issue? Because it seems that everybody, including you, are united in this fight. Why can't we get it right? What would you say to them? No, no, I mean, I will address only one person because there's only one person who wields real power in this country, and that's Uhuru. If you want to fight corruption, go back to institutions. The CID directorate is doing an excellent job. Give it more resources. Give it more money. Give it more personnel. Uh, you know, if, I mean, if you look at, and I don't want to make this point because I've made it many points, many times. If you look at the difference between the current occupant of that office and his predecessor, there is a lot of difference. There's a lot of change. Nowadays, I mean, they do investigation, you know, whether it's corruption or, you know, the small petty crime. Institutions are important. The second one is go back to the courts. The courts have huge challenges. Corruption, incompetence, lack of resources. Give money to the courts. You know, the last seven years of Uhuru's government, eh? every year Uhuru's government has reduced the budget for the judiciary. Every year. Every year. Jubilee has been cutting the budget for the judiciary. And it's very myopic, it's very petty, you know, because they're fighting it. But if you want Kenya to go in the right direction, give the judiciary more, so more money. I want to ask another question yes. of you. Yes. People of your level who have made enough from this country, because you are not a poor man, are there people like you willing to give a service to the country for a period? Because in many countries that have advanced, there comes people from you know, the business world or from private life, who then decide to do something in public life to make a difference. No, no, I, um, I agree and, with and you. The, the, you know what I mean? No, we, I agree. we can't just take and take from society and give nothing back. No, no, I agree with you. I mean, there are many Kenyans, I think, who will give two, three, four, five years of their life to make a change in this country. But there's no need, I mean- they, No, no, they, I am asking this because, uh, and it's point blank, because if Uhuru was to ring you tomorrow and say senior council, I would like you to uh, take you know, a job for the country. Do the following for four or five years. I can't pay you enough because you are a well-to-do person. Will you serve the country? And I'm putting it to you point blank because I'm finding that we are losing the spirit. No, no, first point blank. If Uru will have given me a job, I will not have taken it. I will not take any job uh, in the executive because it's, it's a waste of time, you know. You, you will not make difference in the current political setup. I mean, the way the government is set up is that, you know, it's, it's a stealing government, you know. Everybody steals, you know. This one steals, this one steals. And I think uh, well, the, sec the secretary to the cabinet, uh, Kinyo, was right. And many years ago when he said that, you know, we lose about 40% of our budget to theft. Now it's probably 60%. Moses Wetangula last week was telling me that this country needs a Mudaura. Does Uhuru need a change of, of God? Does no, no, he no. need... We don't need individual... My, you will get it wrong. Institutions. Institutions. So, Process, procedure, mechanisms. I'm asking you this because when Kibaki reached uh, the agro uh, um, problem, he changed course and he had six ministers out. He brought in Michuki. He did what you call a surgery, radical surgery. Does Uhuru need to do something that drastic? Does he, if he limps through this, is he unlikely not to fail? But you see, I mean, uh, when, when, when Kibaki made the change, it was his first term, I think the second year of his first term. And you know, he finished his first term, then he went into his second term. Uh, Uhuru is this in his last term. Maybe he has three, four more years to go. Uh, whether he can change, change or not, maybe it's too late. I mean, where do you change it to? Where do you detour to? I mean, it it's doesn't... It's not maybe, this is point blank. I could remember, maybe Grand Mula unasema zio kuzuri. 
Kama siyo kuzuri useme. Just, no, no, I'm saying uh, <laughs> it's not good. I you mean, know, you know when, when, when uh, Uhuru came with these ideas of the four pillars, I, I told him or I expressed my views that he's wasting his time. Uhuru will not achieve the four pillars. It's a waste of time. That money will be wasted, it will be lost. Because the institutions are not there. My friend, if you want to do a lot of good work in health, for example, if you pour 100 billion into health, they will steal it. <laughs> Won't they? They will steal it. If you say that you are building houses, you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the institution, it's a waste of time. If I was Uhuru, I would have thrown out these four pillars. I would have gone, gone back to the basics. Make the police, you know, law and order. Law and order. If you have no law and order, how can you spend three, four billion dollars in that big four? It will be stolen. This man, Ahmed Abdinazir Abdullahi, as, uh, what are you doing now? What is uh, your, your path ahead? Uh, both acting, are you doing any teaching? No, no, I tell guys, I mean, I, I'm tired of practicing, really. I mean, it's no longer challenging. It. I've said this many times. Uh, I just don't do for money because I think we are past that. Uh, I mean, law is interesting. Sometimes you get very, you know, I mean, cases you that... You choose that, your case. Yes, you choose your case. That's very, they're very important cases that you can do and you must do. But uh, law is like, I mean, I don't see myself practicing another 10 years or... So what are you doing? Are you going yes. to write? Are you going to teach? No, no, are you I going want to, to I do want, business? I want to go back to school. Yes. Yes, yes. And uh, improve your... Yes, do, your, your, yes. I, mean, I think I can do a doctorate. Yes. I've always wanted to do. Yes. I'm working on something. Uh, have you ever had an ambition to sit on the bench? Or, no, no. Uh, so yours would be on the private sector? In, nine, in 2004, the former CJ Gisheruk invited me to become a judge. And he was my good friend. And I told him, you know, if I become a judge, who will make noise for you outside? <laughs> <laughs> you are still doing some publishing from time yes, to time. Yes, yes. We are doing the Nairobi Law Monthly. We have started the Nairobi business. We have a Somali TV called RTN. Yes. Very popular among Somali speaking. Yes. Uh, and uh, let me then ask, uh, in terms of... We want uh, to do some other projects in the region, East Africa. Yes. yes. Uh, in fact, in terms of the governance situation, you've been very clear that uh, Uhuru will need to do something drastic and follow institutions. Uh, there is the issue of the referendum, as I close tonight. Is there a need for one? My view is that you don't need a referendum. We are too divided to have a referendum, you know. I mean, this country is... Referendum to do what first? Well, some say that the executive needs an overhaul. Well, why? I mean, the story say is that people want to create more offices so that we have more, you know, the bill, I mean, but, the but, cost. Lakini kama fundi wa katiba, just way kama fundi, is there something that is glaring that would need... Yes, yes, there are a lot of, like, constitutional commissions, you, I mean, they take a lot of money. They don't need, you, I mean, they, they have to be part-time. You don't need constitutional commissions that are full-time. They take a lot of money. But, you know, all the constitutional commissions have been, most of them have been a waste of time. The land commission, you have seen the damage they have done to land and all this corruption here. So, in my view, we can, there are certain things we can edit the constitution, but we don't have to add other organs, yes. There's a lot of things we can improve on. You say you are a support Jubilee. Uh, now Jubilee has factions. Where, which faction are you? Uh, I'm, I'm not very political, but I thought Jubilee is still united, still one. <laughs> so you're not Kieleweka or uh, Tanga Tanga? No. <laughs> I mean, support in the sense that, you know, if there's election, we, are, we fall, we, we, uh, we are not active on a daily basis. But I think, I mean, if this country wants to move forward, you must have strong institutions like parties, you know. You can't have a new party every time there's an election. I mean, look at, look at, I mean... Uh, Would you ever run for office? No, uh, no, I will not run. Would you ever want to go to the Senate and give wisdom? Or? There's no wisdom anybody gives there. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, there's a lot of good things we can do if we give a team of experts to amend the Constitution, you know, edit it. There's a lot of errors here and there. There's a lot of things we can synchronize. We have learned a lot in the last 10 years. It's a very expensive Constitution. It has a lot of, uh, we can, we can we fine tune it. That's a very interesting idea. You're saying that a team of experts, yes, yes. as opposed to this political process, no, no, this would that be a more, eh? you know, the, the political process is compromised. You know, there are certain people think that they are targets. Certain people think that now that they are in good books of, you know, the people who hold power, they can add one or two things. 
for you to make a credible amendment to the Constitution, it must be very neutral. And the way to do it is to get uh, technicians. Yes, technicians. You can, I mean, the Attorney General can even spearhead such a process, get five good lawyers and say that, you know, what are the things you think we need to add or what are the things we need Will to we get somebody good to replace Maraga? Do you see competent people, you know, behind the scenes that has been talked about by your colleagues? No, no, there are many, there are many law. The, the, I think the important thing is that when we brought uh, Willie Mutunga, the judiciary thought, you know, there's an outsider who has come, he has taken over our institutions. So Maraga was, Maraga's appointment was greatly influenced by that thinking. Now we have seen how someone from inside works. If I was to make a prediction, and which I should not, I think the next chief justice will come from outside the judiciary. I mean, in my view, there's even, uh, I think there's, there's a very good chance that he will be either a lawyer or an academician. But this one, you know, the office of the chief justice needs a powerful intellectual. And of Very course, powerful intellectual. intellectual. And of course, her, the deputy has her, her own problems. So one would argue that the deputy wouldn't be in line. So let, you, let me not disqualify her. But uh, you would think that she would have the authority, the moral authority? No, no. You need an intellectual. You need someone, a thinker, you know, someone gravitas, you know, someone with a standing. Eh? I mean, I can tell you one thing. Uh, the average... But, but that was what the Kajuang, average, Kajuang was known as an intellectual. No, no, yeah, that was... That, <laughs> Ojuang, At the university. Kajuang was a Kanu intellectual, you know. You know, the Kanu guys. I'm surprised that he has survived, you know. Guys, his age mates have gone with Kanu. That he has made a transition is something we should give him a lot of credit, you know. You know, he has made some seamless <laughs> But we don't... For, for, uh, uh, do, do you think we... No, would, no, for, you, for yeah. you to be a chief justice... You must have lived the struggle of Kenyans. Take that point, it's very important. You must have lived the struggle. And that's why Willie made it, because Willie was part of the struggle of Kenyans to have a new constitution. When you have been on the other side of the constitutional making process and you oppose, you can never become a chief justice. Yes. And uh, what about getting a chief justice outside the jurisdiction? We've heard from Ghana, we've heard... Um you know, acumi, what, what, what do you... And I, I support the idea of having judges from foreign jurisdictions. I think there's no harm if we get guys from England, for Australia, or the Commonwealth. Yes. Certain Commonwealth. Yes. Not from Africa, because Africa, the problem is the same, eh? Okay. But I don't think it makes sense for us to have a chief justice who's exactly. a foreigner, because, I mean, he's in charge of uh, one arm of government. There are many competent Kenyans who can become chief justices, yes. Well, you've been uh, watching uh, Point Blank here at KTN News. Uh, senior counsel of the Grand Mullah tells Uhuru, Unachelewa, it may be too late, but you have one chance. Seize the assets of the corrupt. And you start here at Wilson Airport at Nairobi. This is KTN News, and you're watching Point Blank with Ndubiangu, the Grand Mullah. Good, good, good Point Blank, you know. I, I hope we have been answering your questions Point Blank. <laughs> I, I, did you, I hope you like being here. At no, no, I enjoyed it. And uh, it's a good program. And uh, you build on it so that it becomes an institution. Asante Sana. Yes, yes. This is KTN News. Point Blank by TG was filmed on location at the Nairobi Serena Hotel.